we began to share on the seven letters that the Lord Jesus commanded John to write to the churches of Asia Minor. And in them are both encouragements and warnings for the church throughout the church age. And specifically upon us, upon whom the end of the ages has fallen. That is very high English for saying we are that generation who are going to see the culmination of so many things that are written in Scripture that lead up to the most phenomenal event, which is the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will set up His kingdom upon the earth. And there's a stunning Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul, by the Spirit, writes that when He comes, He'll put an end to all authority, He'll put an end to all rule, and He'll put an end to all power. That when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, there will not be an earthly government. We will not go to the municipality to sort out our affairs. There will be a godly government with its central power base being in Jerusalem with administrative offices all over the globe being administered by the saints of the Most High. For do you not know that you will rule and reign with Jesus Christ? That's part of the Bible. The part not spoken about because most churches are too worried about receiving the wealth of the world and not preparing to rule and reign with Jesus Christ over an incorruptible kingdom. And I don't know about you, but when I read that uh, scripture uh, during the course of this week, I got so excited. I really did. I got so excited because there is coming a government upon the earth which is not ruled by men. Not one human being who is unsaved, unregenerated, and does not have a resurrected body will be part of that government. The government of our God will be reigned by, over by the Lord Jesus Christ together with His resurrected saints who will meet Him in the air at His coming. And if that doesn't get you excited, then nothing will. Amen. Praise God. Let's have some tea and coffee and go home. Because that's all we need to know. There's coming a government upon the earth and saints, between now and then, God is wanting to hew out for Himself a people to rule and reign in that government. He is trying to teach His church kingdom living, kingdom principles. Not so we can rule and reign now, but we can rule and reign then. And so when we look at the letters to the seven churches, please understand one thing. As I said last week, God is a God of grace, love, and mercy. The very essence of His nature is to seek and to save. He is a God of wrath and of judgment, and He will punish the ungodly with eternal damnation. He will. It's not His first choice. This is the complexity of God, something that you and I as human beings cannot grasp. When we try to understand God in our human framework, we then create our own gods. We then break the Ten Commandments, which says you shall have no other God beside me. When we try to understand God and put Him into our framework, into our understanding, we are basically building an idol. God is merciful. God is gracious. The heart of God is to seek and to save. His love is epitomized in Jesus Christ that He sent His Son to pay for our redemption so that we would not have to face an eternal damnation, eternal judgment, an eternity without Him. Everything in Scripture is written to point us towards Jesus so that we will surrender our life to His Lordship. Because God is holy, because God understands Himself beyond anything that we can grasp. He understands himself, we don't. He knows he must deal with sin. So he knows what awaits the ungodly. And he's pleading, not only with the church, because there's so much in the church that is ungodly, but he pleads with the world continually, come to repentance. It is important I tell you this, because when we read and study the seven letters, Jesus is clearly unimpressed with the church. 
clearly. And as it was then, so it is now. The Lord who loves us is unimpressed with his bride. Every morning I wake up and I say, Dear God, please send a loving, gentle pastor to this church. Please, O oh God, send an anointed man who can preach joy and happiness. And the more I pray, and the more I yearn, the more gives, God gives me messages to bring correction. It's not because I hate you. And it's not because God hates you. It's on the contrary. It's because God loves you. Because God so loved the world that He gave His Son. God loves you. Like a good father, He doesn't want you to perish. He doesn't want you to go to eternal hell. He wants you to be with Him. He's Abba. Abba in Hebrew. Daddy, He's, he's the one who loves His children, who dotes around His children. God is... The, the, the word Abba in Hebrew is not like the word Father in English. Father is a position. Daddy is... A person, it's one who loves, who desires passionately to have his children around him. Rian, you want to say something? Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. But I want you to know that we do love you. I love you passionately. And it might today, it might be an ouch for some and encouraging for others because the Word of God is a two edged sword. It always happens has a twofold purpose. When the word, word of God is drawn, when the sword of God is drawn, it's going to do one of two things. It's going to cut your heart and it's going to cause you to repent. You're gonna, we're going to see ourselves through the light of God's word and we're going to say, Lord, I'm not measuring up. Forgive me. And it will produce in you a godly sorrow unto repentance. And that repentance will draw you closer to God. And the closer you draw to God, the more joyous it is. I mean, for some of us, the time of worship now was awesome, wasn't it? Because you were coming before God with a clear conscience. There is no sin of which to be ashamed. For you've dealt with your heart. You've dealt with those things in your life that are a hindrance. But for some others, it was not easy or not even possible to worship God. Because you're not in a position of right standing. You see, the two-edged sword, to one, it cuts to he who receives will cut, so that the, the cutting will bring repentance. And to the other, it will be your judge at the end of the age. You'll be judged by the word you heard and did not respond to. Now, the most disheartening revelation that any pastor must come to, or any minister or any Christian must come to, is this. None of us are able to change another. No matter how much we love them, no matter how much we care for them, no matter how much we want to see them change, because who in their right mind would want to see somebody go to hell? Nobody. But we can't. You see, because not even God can. God can only change those who present themselves before Him and say, Be my God, be my Lord, let your will be done. If we don't invite God to have His will in our lives, He is powerless to change us. So with this revelation that I cannot change anybody who wishes to remain unchanged, we will continue. Let's pray. Father God, we bless you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you have sent your word. As we sang just now, it is a light unto our path. It gives light and understanding and direction and shows us the way in which we should walk, a way that leads to you, eternal life in the presence of him who loved us with a love beyond comprehension. My God, as we come to look at your word, I ask, Father, for your grace that by your Spirit you'll carry your word, not the word of a man, but the word of the living God into the heart of every soul here. And I pray, O oh God, for every heart that will open up, for every heart that will say, Lord, do to me as you desire, that life will come.
that some today will find repentance and in doing so will find ultimate forgiveness and reconciliation back to you that they may be filled with the joy of the Lord and a knowledge of salvation in Jesus' name. Give me grace to teach. Amen. Last week, we looked at the letter to the church, to the Ephesians in Revelation chapter 2. And we saw that here was a church that was very active in the things of God in terms of their works. They had a passion for the Lord, they had a passion for truth. They were a very active church. But there was a major flaw in their church. And that was they had lost their first love. And that really was the theme of last week. So I don't want to revisit it. But unless we love God with all our heart and soul, all the works we do become irrelevant. God is not interested in our works. He's interested in our relationship. When the relationship that we have with God is right, and we truly love Him, then everything we do for God will come as a result of that. I will want to tell people about the love of God and the salvation in Jesus because I'm so full of the love of God. The song we sang again this morning, the mercy we received, we give to others. Why? Because I'm so full of the mercy of God because I'm in relationship. Without that relationship, the works we do will always be dead. So God is into relationship. He's Abba, he's daddy. He loves his children. He wants us to be in relationship with him. If we don't love him, we're not in relationship. And so that was the rebuke to the church of Ephesus. What we didn't cover, however, because I wanted to stay on that theme, and I wanted to encourage folk to pursue their first love, and so I purposefully left out a portion of Scripture, which we are going to deal with today. And that is in verse 6 of Revelation chapter 2, where the Lord says, But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, only twice in Scripture is, are the Nicolaitans referred to. And very little is actually known about the Nicolaitans. There are many opinions and there are many theories But if you really want to do a study and delve into historical writings and documentation regarding the Nicolaitans, you're going to find very little. But it is important to know who they were, what they stood for. Because in knowing that, you'll understand why Jesus hated them. That's a strong word. Jesus hated hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Why was that? Well, firstly, who were the Nicolaitans? All right. For most of us, the answer is, I don't know, which is fair enough, because at some stage, all of us never knew. The Nicolaitans comes from two Greek words. You want to write them down? Okay. Okay. Nicolas, N-I-K, I should have put it on a slideshow, but I didn't have time. N-I-K-O-L-A-O-S, or I should say Nicolas, comes from the Greek word Nikos, N-I-K-O-S. Nikos, and the second word, Laos, L-A-O-S. Nikos, in the Greek, means to conquer or to subdue to rule over, to conquer, to subdue, and to rule over. Nikos. Laos means the people. From where we get the English word that we use in church, laity, the people. So the Nicolaitans were those who conquered, who overcame, who had power over the people. Now, many people believe that that is speaking about the ecclesial structure of the church. In other words, you have the pope or the bishop or the pastor 
or the senior pastor who rule over the flock, and that there's this, there's this huge gulf between the leadership of the church and the people. And they say, that is the spirit of the Nicolaitans. Well, that is partially true, but it's not ultimately true. The Nicolaitans were far worse than just a separation between the professional ecclesia and the laity. The Nicolaitans, it is believed, and now for those of you who enjoy history, three of the early first century church writers wrote about, very briefly, about the Nicolaitans. Irenaeus wrote that the Nicolaitans were heretical followers of Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch, who was chosen as one of the seven, which we see in the book of Acts chapter 5. You can keep your place in Revelation and quickly, for those of you who are interested, turn over to Acts chapter 5, where the apostles appoint, sorry, it's Acts chapter 6. Let me humble myself and try to wear these. Although they only work when I'm close up. So, in Acts chapter 6, the Bible tells us in verse 1, now in those days, there was an, there were, when the numbers of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a murmur against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So what happens is the twelve then summon the people and tell them to pick out for themselves, in verse 3, seek out from among your brethren, Seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And so we see that in verse 5, the seven are chosen. And the, multi and the saying pleased the multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Now a proselyte means one who was a Gentile who had converted to Judaism. So, Nicholas was not a Jew by birth. He was a Jew by conversion. His background in Antioch was probably a form of paganism because that was what the religions of the days. You worship the Roman gods, the Greek gods, which were one and the same, and you serve God according to their rituals, which were often debaucherous and perverted and immoral. So he comes from the pagan background and he becomes a convert to Judaism. And then later on, he becomes a convert to Jesus. Now, according to Irenaeus, he was deemed the father of the Nicolaitans. Now, please understand something. We don't know if Nicholas was the father or if certain disciples claimed that he taught them this doctrine. So we're not going to badmouth Nicholas of Antioch. But historically, he's attributed as being the founder of this sect. Hippolytus added that Nicholas departed from true doctrine. So Hippolytus, another church historian, he said that at some stage, Nicholas departed from sound doctrine. Clement, again, a very well-known figure in the first century church, Clement of Alexandria, he claimed that Nicholas was an ascetic. You know what an ascetic is? It's not an anesthetic, although it has the same connotation. An ascetic is one who believes that everything of this world is fallen and therefore evil. And so they seek to simplify their lives, to live a life of abstention, abstention from food, abstention from sexual relations, and from which we have the, the Catholic monks of today who abstain from the corruption of society. This is what was claimed by Clement. However, his followers, the followers of, of Nicholas, the Nicolaitans, were anything but ascetics. They believed that there was a distinct separation between the spirit and the physical. So I could serve God with my spirit, and I could live in the flesh, fulfilling the lust of the flesh, and because there was a distinction between spirit and, and body, whatever I did in my body had no impact on my spirit. 
So they were into wife swapping and orgies. They believed that it, there was no reason to withhold yourself from any expression of the carnal nature. That was the sin of the Nicolaitans. That God, we serve in our spirit by grace, and we serve in our flesh the carnal nature, and we do not withhold any pleasure from it. It is a perversion of the Christian faith which is alive and well in our churches today. We call that expression the hyper-grace movement. God understands. God understands that we are fallen beings. God understands that we have a sin nature. God understands that we cannot withhold ourselves from sin. Therefore, it's okay to sin. God understands. And so what we have in many of our churches today is we have a perversion and an immorality. We have people sleeping with each other. We have perverted sex. We have wickedness and lying and cheating and adultery. And it's all fine because God understands. This is the sin of the Nicolaitans, which thing Jesus hates. If Jesus hates something, is there any chance of that sin or a person who practices that sin being saved while they're in that state? Is there any hope for them eternally while they are in that state? Clearly not. Jesus said over and over again, at the Last Supper, he says, said to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15 is one such account. And there are many, both in John as well as his epistle in 1 John. First, uh, sorry, John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And then he goes on to say, and I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you, and He will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Verse 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is He who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And you can continue reading from that chapter of Scripture. Jesus made it very clear that if we loved him, we obey his commandments. Grace is not licensed to sin. Grace is given that when we do sin and we truly repent, there is instant forgiveness. Grace is given... For the forgiveness of repented sin, not given as license to sin. Because the blood of Christ was shed, it doesn't mean I can live like the devil. That is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. If you are in sin and you practice sin, Paul writes to the church of Galatia, he says, those who practice such things, adulteries and fornications and murders and hatreds and outbursts of wrath and jealousies and covetousness and drunkenness, if you practice that, if you live in that, the Bible says you will not inherit eternal life. Does that mean God is not a God of mercy and grace? On the contrary, He's calling us out of that. He's saying, come out of that. I love you. If you continue in that, you're going to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. Please repent. This spirit was in the church at Ephesus, and it was in the church at Pergamos, which we're going to get to. Interesting. Ephesus, Pergamos. Now, Ephesus we know something of when we read the book of Acts. Ephesus was the chief city of the worship of Diana. The temple of Diana was founded in Ephesus. The craftsmen made their living making idols of Diana, the queen of heaven. And in her worship... Sexual immorality was very much part of an expression of worship to her, just like in paganism. 
where they have orgies and dance naked but on this, at certain times of the year. Sexual perversion was part of the worship of Diana. Then you get Pergamos. Pergamos was a center to the worship of the god of medicine. It was also the center of emperor worship in Asia. And emperor worship was also expressed through orgies and sexual immorality. And so in these two cities that had a demonic stronghold of sexual immorality over them, we find the Nicolaitans. Interesting. Where there's a demonic stronghold of sexual perversion, we have Nicolaitans. Fast forward 1900 years to a world in which sexual immorality doesn't, is not localized in cities, it is worldwide. Sex sells. That's why you have scanty clad girls draped over motor cars and motorbikes. That's why when you, every TV program, there is at least one scene when they go to bed with each other. We are being bombarded by every sexual immorality. Most Christians shouldn't even switch on the TV set except to watch the news. Because everything is perverse. And so the spirit that follows sexual immorality doesn't just stay in Ephesus, but now spreads wherever sexual perversion and immorality is deemed acceptable. In South Africa, like most countries of the world, in fact virtually all, it is acceptable to commit adultery. Years ago, you were locked up for that. It's acceptable to have sex outside of marriage. Pornography is acceptable. It's legalized. Perversion is acceptable. And so what happens is the spirit of the age seeks to come into the church. And many in the church just open the door and say, Hallelujah, come in. We're saved by grace. We stand by grace. Grace, 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 grace. And who are our favorite preachers? The Grace guys, the Joel Osteens, the Joseph Princes, the guys that tell you God just loves you and I'm not going to judge you. Well, saints, we're called to judge each other in love, in grace, in mercy. Paul rebukes the church at Corinth in which there was sexual immorality. And he says, is there not one wise amongst you? Is not one who could stand up and make godly judgment? Saints, I am here to make judgment. According to the Scripture, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Hear the word of the Lord. This word was written before my parents ever met each other, before their parents ever met each other. This word has got nothing to do with David Nathan. I am but a donkey reciting what was written 1900 years ago. If you don't like the Scripture, you take it up with Paul, who will then point you directly to the Holy Spirit. I am not speaking of my own volition. I'm not writing what I wrote. I'm sorry, I'm not reading what I wrote. This has not got nothing to do with me. I have got to write the truth, speak the truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly do not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters since then, you would need to go out of the world. Paul is saying, I never ask you to break fellowship with the sexually immoral, wicked people of the world. But he clarifies in verse 11. But now I've written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? Those who are, but those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves that wicked person. Woof. 
Listen to Asher and Enoch. If we allow sexual immorality or any sin in our churches, what happens is a little leaven will live in the lump. There was a great church in Kempton Park, not very far from us, that was founded by an incredible man of God, a humble man of God, and a phenomenal church was formed. But then, as he grew older, and the young men in the church began to rise to leadership, the church changed, and it was okay to sleep around. It was okay to commit adultery, because we don't judge these things, you see. That church today might numerically be huge, but spiritually is dead. But the greatest tragedy is there are people in that church thinking that they are saved. You see, the two-edged sword of God comes out and says, if I am an adulterer, if I am covetous, if I am in any sin, it's going to cut my heart. And I've got, two, I've got two choices. Father, forgive me. I don't want to be this person anymore. Be gracious. Be merciful. Cleanse me. Wash me. Save me. Give me the grace to live in holiness. Or else I can say, I don't care what you say. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 3. He says, this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. We are fallen people. All of us are fallen. All of us have a sin nature. But some of us desire to repent. That's the distinction between us and the rest of the human race. We're not better than them. We're not holier than anyone else. We're not more favored than anyone else. The Christian is the one who, when confronted with God's righteous standard, says, my God, I am guilty of sinning against you. I am worthy of your judgment. Have grace upon me. And God, because He's a merciful, loving God, pours out such grace, such love. He washes our sins away. He cleanses us. He indwells us by the Holy Spirit. And we're new creations. And now we don't want to sin. Now there's something in us that finds sin distasteful. Before, sin was all we wanted. We were addicted to wickedness. But now that I'm born again, God is in me. And I find sin repulsive. What's happened to me? God saved me. God saved you. Now I don't have to fight sin in my own strength. I just got to submit to God with all my heart and He gives me the power to overcome sin because His heart becomes my heart and He's yearning my yearning. What separates the saved from the unsaved? A willingness to surrender. God loves both categories equally. God measures out the same mercy and grace to both categories. God calls both categories. The unsaved have the voice of God ringing in their ears, just as you and I have the voice of God ringing in their ears. The Holy Spirit has come to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. God in His love has sent His Spirit to woo the world to Him. But when the world say, says, I want darkness, leave me alone. I want to sleep with my boyfriend, says the girl. I want to sleep with my boyfriend, says the man. I want to murder my unborn child in my womb because it's not convenient at this time for me to have a child, says the woman. Because the world loved darkness. Now, saints, as it was in the early church, so it is now. The early church was birthed in a time of great wickedness upon the earth. The Romans were perverted. They were wicked. They took over from the Greeks who were perverted and wicked. Don't be under the delusion to think that the, the uh, scenario in which the early church found itself was one of peace and tranquility and uprightness. It was a wicked time where the Romans for fun would watch people murdering each other in the Colosseums and in the circuses, give women and children to wild animals and watch with joy as the animals would tear these innocent people apart. This was... The spirit of the, at the time of the early church. 
And in the midst of that, God called His people to holiness because we can live in holiness by the Spirit of God. To Him who will surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, to Him He gives the power to live uprightly in this fallen world. And so the Nicolaitans come in. Just like every other false doctrine comes in by Satan. And he appeals to the fallen nature of man. Oh, you can have salvation and you can have the sin of the flesh. You can have it both. And Jesus turns around and he says, I hate this thing. Please. Holiness is the minimum requirement to see God. So the writer of Hebrews says, Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. We are only deemed holy when our lives are being sanctified. When sin is distasteful, when we hate sin and we cry to God, Lord, purify my heart. Now, do we fall? Yes. Do we blow it? Yes. Do we live in sin? No. That's the difference. Don't cop out to the devil's lie and say, well, God understands. I've read this good book a number of times. And I've yet to find one scripture that even slightly hints that God understands. The Bible says God knows what's in man. He knows what man is like, and because of that, he sent his son to save man, because man cannot save himself. God loves you. If you are living in sin and you think you're a Christian, please, I don't wish to hurt you, but I do wish to offend you. I want to offend you so badly that you go search the Scriptures. Or better still, that you listen to God speaking in your spirit. Because the Holy Spirit right now is taking His Word, not mine, and He's speaking to us. And He's saying, repent, please, repent. You've got that tugging, that nagging in your spirit. You've got one or two choices. Repent, or you can say, I forget it. And sear your conscience. But now let's move on. That was the Nicolaitans, which I left out from last week. Please, God loves you. I love you. I don't want to see anybody go to hell. Right now, my entire family are going to hell. I don't have one saved member of my family. Not on my side, not on Jackie's side. With the exception of Jackie and my two kids, there's not one person in my family that is born again. I don't want one of them to go to hell, but the reality is they are. And I preach to them like I preach to you because I don't want anyone to go to hell. Now, I know I might only be speaking to a handful of people, but please... You're important, and you need to hear, because God loves you. Stop the sin. You're going to go to hell. It's not worth it. Right, moving on, hopefully to some better news. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And to the messenger, remember, the word angel, messenger, does not speak to the spirit being over Smyrna. It refers to the Leadership of the church of Smyrna. These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. As I said last week, Jesus, as he appears to John, John notices certain attributes. Jesus speaks about himself in certain manners. I am the first, I am the last, I am the Alpha and the Omega. John uh, says that out of his mouth came a two-edged sword. That which Jesus identifies himself with, and that which John sees, Jesus will incorporate into each letter. Here to the church of Smyrna, he says, I am the first and the last who was dead and came to life. He identifies himself as the beginning and the end of life and as the resurrection from the dead. That's how he identifies himself, as the one who rose again. And it's befitting because the church of Smyrna was a good church. And let's read. Verse 9, I know your works, your tribulation and poverty. That word poverty means lack of lucre. It means to be penniless. He says, I know your works, your tribulation. We all know what tribulation is. It's the sufferings that we undergo for Jesus. 
and poverty, but you are rich. Listen to this beautiful thing. You are materially poor, but you are spiritually so phenomenally rich, so incomprehensibly wealthy. Don't look at your financial state, saints. God is not interested in making you millionaires, please. Despite what they say down the road. God is not interested in your prosperity. He's interested in your character. Because kings and rulers need to be groomed, not distracted. And for many of us, wealth will be a distraction. I'm not saying that there aren't rich Christians and God doesn't have a problem with that. He doesn't. He doesn't have a problem with rich Christians. He has a problem with Christians who want to get rich. Let's call it what it is. Covetousness. It's greed. I want to be rich. Why do you want to be rich? I want to give to the kingdom. How much are you giving now? Nothing. I'm only a place to give. Giving is a hard thing. If you've got two slices of bread, you give one away. If you go and give 10 cents away, you're not going to give 10 million rand away. See, because that's covetousness. You want to be rich because you want money. Because you want money. Let's just call things what they are. Because sometimes we pussyfoot over issues. They were materially poor. But spiritually, spiritually, this church was rich. And so are we who love the Lord with all our heart. We might not have two pennies to rub together. We might not have much to show. But let me tell you, let me assure you before God, your wealth is immeasurable. For yours is the kingdom of the eternal living God. That's what I call an inheritance. Eat your heart out, Bill Gates. All right. Verse 9, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Oy. Well, let's just deal with this thing. Christians are under this, this, this deception that Jews serve God. The number of Christians have told me... You're a Jew that came to Jesus. You must know the Old Testament. And I look at them and say, you've got to be kidding. Jews don't know the Old Testament. Because if Jews knew the Old Testament, they'd find Jesus in the Old Testament. They'd be born again and they'd be in the church. We call that logic 101. Although we do understand that Paul does write to the church at Corinth, he says there are not many wise amongst you. So most Christians don't really think, although thinking is not a, a sin. It's actually encouraged in the Lord. Jews don't study the Old Testament. The Jewish faith revolves around the Sidur. Set prayers for every single occasion you can imagine. Liturgy for every event. For the Sabbath, for the feasts, for the new moon, for the old moon, for the honeymoon, for the red balloon. You name it. If there's an occasion, there's a prayer. That's Judaism. Why do we do this thing? As Tevye says in Fiddle on the Roof, tradition. We do this thing because our parents did this thing, because their parents did this thing, and their great parents did this thing. We do because they did. It's like a good Catholic. Why do you bow down to Mary? Because the Pope says so. What does the Pope know? Really nothing. Because he doesn't read the Bible. (gasps) Papa doesn't read the Bible? No, because Papa thinks he is Papa. Because he's submitting to Mama. (laughs) Who, of course, is just an incantation of Diana, the Queen of Heaven, Semiramis. The Jews were a synagogue of Satan because they were entrusted with the word of God and despised the word of God. And having forsaken the grace of God, sought to establish their own righteousness 
through a series of laws and obediences which transcended the original 613 of Moses. Those who have the Word of God and ignore it, reinterpret it, and add to it are a synagogue of Satan. The first synagogue of Satan were the rebellious, unrepentant Jews who refused to examine the Scriptures and find Christ in it. The next synagogue of Satan are made up of Gentiles who have the Word of God who refuse to examine the Scriptures to see what God's requirement is. So you might say that you and I fit very well into the category of the church of Smyrna. For we are among a people who are a synagogue of Satan, who have the word of God and reject it. Be encouraged. We are living in a time of apostasy where we see most of you are, f- are familiar with what's happening in the church world. Same-sex marriage, the Enchia church, homosexuals in the pulpits, other ways to Jesus, interfaith. Verse 10, do not fear any of those things which, are about to come, which are, you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Here's a church who's holding on to the Lord, who despite all the wickedness around them, despite the tribulation and the poverty and all the things that they are experiencing, are holding fast to God. And then the Lord says to them, you're going to have 10 days of tribulation. Now, that could be understood in the Greek is either there's going to be 10 days or 10 years of tribulation, or there are going to be 10 tribulations, 10 testings. The translation to English is not clear because the Greek originally is not clear. So 10 days could mean 10 days, 10 years, or 10 tribulations, 10 periods of tribulation. But that is a reality, saints, because you and I are facing persecution. Jesus said we're going to be hated that the end-time church... Specifically in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says that the end time church will suffer horrendous persecution. The end time church will be betrayed by one another, by the false church, by their own parents. But Jesus says, be faithful until death and I'll give you the crown of life. Our life does not end at death. It begins a new chapter. We must start focusing on the things that are above. The only way you and I are going to endure what is being unleashed and will intensify upon the church and upon the world is if we keep our eyes focused on those things which are above. If we don't keep Focusing on the Lord, on His kingdom, we are going to fall. We are going to be overwhelmed by what is coming upon the earth. And so Jesus encourages them and says, Be faithful unto death. That's when it ends. Your tribulation is going to end at death. So keep being faithful. Saints, there isn't going to be a respite. Please hear what I'm saying. Things are not going to get better. They're only going to get worse. And you and I are going to be delivered from this fallen world either through physical death or should we remain until the Lord returns through the rapture. But there ain't no such thing as a kingdom coming until Jesus deals with the Antichrist and the kingdoms of this world. Okay. Verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He overcome shall not be hurt by the second death. Fifty years ago, we didn't have to worry about the end times. If anybody here that was a Christian 50 years ago? Two, one, half? Okay, none. Nobody worried about the end of the world 50 years ago. It was after the Second World War. Okay, mind you, speak on the correction. It was the Cold War. But life was genuinely... 
there was a morality. There was a sense of morality in society in the, in the 50s. The 60s changed that. But in the 50s, there was a sense of morality, a sense of family. You know, the, the, the wife was always portrayed as this happy woman at home who loved her family, cooked her family, had the latest Hoover and the latest Calvinator because she was going to clean her house for her family. She was going to cook this awesome meal for her family. And she had these beautiful children who were well-behaved. That was the 50s and the end of the world, the disobedient children and rebellious this and rebellious. That was science fiction. Fast forward 50 years. And we're living in a time of wickedness. And Jesus says, just he overcomes, he who stays faithful to me, says, shall not be hurt by the second death. You see, it's the second death we've got to worry about. The first death is easy. See, the first death is death to self. Once you've died to self, then there's no fear of physical death. When you have died to yourself, when you've, had a, when you've made the choice to not live for yourself, but to live for God, and it's a tough choice, because let's face it, sin is pleasurable. If sin wasn't pleasurable, nobody would be doing it. If there's no pleasure in sin, we'd all be saints. So when we make a decision to give our lives to Jesus Christ, that is the first death. From there on, we don't fear death, because it just is a reward. It's just a gate. It, to be with the Lord. But the second death is spoken of in the book of Revelation much. The second death is the eternal judgment of those who have rejected Jesus. And that is an eternal death. Eternal suffering in an indescribable hell that is reserved for the devil, his angels, and those who wish to reject God. It is not a place where God wants anyone to go. He wants his people to be faithful to him. The worst that Satan can do to you is kill you. And after that, he can do no more. The worst that a man can do to you is take your life. And after that, he can do no more. But God not only can take your physical life, but he can take your spiritual life and put it into the eternal damnation and that's what God's heart is so as Jesus writes the church of Smyrna it is tough being a Christian if anybody tells you come to Jesus everything's going to be okay they are deceived and in a false church and they believe in the false Jesus coming to Jesus is not easy coming to Jesus takes courage coming to Jesus takes incredible humility and to stand for Christ is not easy. Any coward can go with the flow. I'm not interested in somebody going with the crowd. They don't impress me at all. Serving Jesus takes incredible courage. But he gives us the grace, and that's the beautiful thing. We don't have to walk in our own strength. We walk in the supernatural grace by the Holy Spirit. And we can walk, and we can not only just walk, but we can... We can run in Christ. We're not defeated. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, hard pressed, but not downcast. We are overcomers through Jesus Christ and through the grace and the blood of the Lord by His Spirit who indwells us. God gives grace to His children to stand. This is the good news, saints. When we love God with all our heart, when we hate the the things the Nicolaitans like Jesus hates, the compromise, the wickedness in our churches, when we stick to the pure word of God and we're willing to suffer for Jesus, we have this assurance of eternal life. We have a kingdom over which you and I will reign with Jesus. And there's so much to say about that, but for another time, it is good to serve the Lord. But for those of us who are going to compromise, Hell is the only future. Please, today make a choice who you will serve. For this church, I am under instruction by the Spirit of the living God, through His Word, to root out wickedness. Not that to kick out everybody who has sinned, 
I said, I have to kick myself out first. Not to kick out anybody who themselves is battling, but wants to serve God. God has grace upon the soul who is battling but wants to serve Him. That's the beauty of, of the Lord, because He's merciful. And there's a wonderful scripture in Romans, which I say often and speak often because I relate to it much. Bear with the weaknesses of the weak in Romans chapter 14 or 15, but it's somewhere there. We might not be overcoming, we might be struggling with stuff, but if our heart is to serve God, there is grace and mercy. But if we know the truth and we choose to live in sin, there is no grace, there is no mercy, but a fearful expectation of judgment, and it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. To the weak, God gives grace. To the stubborn and rebellious, God brings judgment. So as the pastor of this church, together with the leaders of this church, we're going to have to say, people, if you're going to live in sin, out. Don't come into this church. I'm going to pick you up personally, and then if you still come back the next week, I'm going to pick you up, pick you up publicly, and we're going to ask you to leave. Today is the day of decision. You either give your life to Jesus, or you go into your sin. But don't come back next week unrepentant. If you're battling, we're here for you. If you fall short during the week and you repent a thousand times, we love you. We can say amen. We can relate to you. Are you getting me? Are you hearing? Don't let the devil rob you of this. Sometimes we struggle, but our heart is for God. I'm not talking to you. That's grace. You hear me? That's grace. If we're saying, I'm not going to change, I refuse to change, there's no grace. You get it? I'm going to live like I am. I'm just going to come to church next week because God understands. You, uh, no grace. You fall during the week and say, dear God, forgive me. Grace, 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 we'll cry with you. We'll say we've been there with you. We'll walk with you. We'll love you because we can relate to you. But goats, out. All right. Praise the Lord. We love you. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. I want to be part of a church where there's a desire for holiness. Will we fall short? Yes. Will we mess up? Yes. But will we tolerate people who adamantly want to live in sin. Hell no. And if to next week it's just me and my wife, praise the Lord. More communion for it to go around. Please, God loves you. We love the pastors in the church and we bless God for them. But sometimes we need those gifts that will just call a spade a spade. Because God loves us and we need to know His standard, what His expectation is, because God hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But to those in Pergamos who hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, God says, I'll give you the crown of life. I'll give you a white stone. I'll write your name on a white stone. We'll get into that next week. The white stone. What does it mean? It's glorious. Is this crystal clear to everybody? Are there any questions? Please, I have come across firmly. I make no apology for that. But my desire is that all will be saved. Please, whom God loves, He chastises. We need to know what God requires so that we can be saved. Please don't harden your heart. We're going to have communion now. Communion is a...